Okay, we're going to do part two of 7b, and we're going to talk about um, what are called molecular and empirical formulas. And in order to do that, I'm going to fall back on what we just did for a minute with percent composition. So if you look at two compounds, um, dinitrogen tetroxide and nitrogen dioxide, name both of these using prefixes, which we just did, and define the percent composition of nitrogen and oxygen for both. Now, nitrogen dioxide, like we said, is NO2. And the percent composition would be like this. This is just because we've already done this. You go moles to grams, you find the total for nitrogen, <coughs> excuse me, uh, you find the total for oxygen. And I did this simply, again, because there's two, nit two oxygens, one nitrogen. Divide by the total, I figure out 30.45% is nitrogen, 69.55 is oxygen. If I double check it, they both add back up to um, 100, so I know that I've done the math right. Now, if I look at, <coughs> excuse me, dinitrogen tetroxide, actually there should not be an A there, right, tetroxide, be N2O4, um, and it comes out exactly the same, okay? So you've got your 30.45% nitrogen and 69.55% oxygen. Now, it's important to know that the, the mass percentage is the same, but they're very different compounds, which you can see from the um, kind of ball and stick figures, all right? And this is why with molecular compounds, two nonmetals, we do not reduce down because these are two different compounds with two very different set of properties and what that entails. So we're going to talk about two different types of formulas today. The first is what's called the empirical formula. Now, empirical formula contains the simplest whole number ratio of atoms. Okay, I've talked about the fact that we don't necessarily always reduce down. Um, it's not necessarily the correct molecular formula or the actual formula of the molecule, and that's because with molecules, they don't have to be simple whole numbers. Okay, again, here's another example. Here's boron trihydride, where you have one boron in the middle and three hydrogens. Then you have diboron hexahydride, okay? Two very different com compounds, but they both would reduce back down to a simpler BH3, so they both have the same empirical formula, but different molecular formulas. That's exactly what it just says right there. Okay, so let's do some steps. First, if you're finding the empirical formula, you convert the percentage to grams by assuming that there's 100 grams of a total sample. This is if you're given percent composition. Okay, so this obviously ties to what we were doing earlier in the unit. You then convert grams to moles for each element, identify the small moles value, and divide each mole value by that smallest value. Now, I know that sounds hideous, and it's going to make more sense when you see an example, but it all comes back to the fact that formulas still give us mole ratios, in that if I have water, which is H2O, there's two moles of hydrogen for every one mole of oxygen, two atoms of hydrogen for every one atom of oxygen, but ultimately a formula gives us mole ratio, so that's why we can do this these steps. Okay, so quantitative analysis, remember that refers to numbers, shows that a compound contains um, 32.38% sodium, 22.65% sulfur, 44.99% oxygen. We need to find the empirical formula. Now the first thing we're going to do is we're just going to pretend we have grams. So all we're going to do is get rid of these percent signs and substitute them with grams so that we can go grams to moles and then be able to convert the rest. Now I've given you some of the work so that you can see um, how to do it, but the first step is to go grams to moles for each element. So sodium, we had 32.38, we divide it by the molar mass to get 1.408. You always want to carry at least four significant figures in this step, and you're going to see why in a minute. Sulfur, again, we divide by the molar mass of sulfur, 0 0.7063 moles of sulfur. Oxygen, now you'll notice when we, when we do this, we go back to the amount for only one of those atoms. Okay, that's it. We don't we don't know how many there are, so we just have one oxygen, one sulfur, one sodium. And we do not have to worry about the Hunkel fibber diatomic stuff. Okay, this is just one atom of that compound. Okay, next step is to divide by the smallest amount. So I'm going to take all of them and divide by 0 0.7063. Now, before I show you the math, I want to remind you what we're ultimately trying to figure out. We are essentially trying to figure out the x values for this compound. So how many sodiums, how many sulfurs, how many oxygens? And I think most of us would recognize the fact that all of these x's have to be whole numbers. We're not going to get 1.5 atoms of oxygen. So now, although I've harped on you in significant figures all year, 
we're now looking for whole numbers. So when you do this math, and even if you just eyeball it, right, 14 divided by 7, or 1.4 divided by 7 is going to come out pretty close to 2. Okay, divide it by itself, this one's going to come out to be 1. This one's going to come out pretty close to 4, because remember, we need these to be whole numbers. So now we just go ahead and we plug them in for these x values. So sodium is going to be Na2, sulfur just 1, and for oxygen there's 4. Okay, and then, <clears throat> excuse me, once we have all that done, we also can name it. And the name of this one would be sodium sulfate. Okay, so sodium sulfate, but we just get it numerically instead of from the name. Okay, divide by the smallest, which we did. All right, now we also can get it from mass composition. We don't have to assume we have 100 grams if they give us an actual amount in grams. Now there's a mistake here on this next slide. Other than that, the steps are all the exact same way. We go grams to moles, we divide by the smallest, we find the ratio. Okay, this is wrong. <laughs> all right, because even if you look at it, if I have 10.150 grams sample of a compound containing only phosphorus and oxygen, 4.433 grams of those are phosphorus. So if I know that the rest has to be oxygen, if I take 10.150 and I subtract 4.433, I end up with, and I can keep my three sig figs, 5.717 grams, and that's my oxygen. Okay, all right, so let's take to the next step here. We convert the mass values to moles. So we had our grams of phosphorus to moles by dividing by the molar mass. We go grams of oxygen to moles by dividing by the molar mass. And remember, the next step, once we go grams to moles, is to then divide by the smallest value. And the smallest value is going to be this 0.1431. Again, we're looking for whole numbers because what we're trying to solve for are those x values, and they have to be whole numbers. Um, one, four, three, one. Now, do this on your calculator if you did not do the last one, just to make sure you see what you get. This one comes out to be one. Well, this one comes out to be about 2.5. Now, if it was 2.999, I can round it up. 2.01, I can round it down. 2.5, I can't ignore that. So what I have to do is multiply everything by an integer in order to get rid of it. Now, if I take 0.5, multiply it by 2, well, 2.5 times 2, I'm going to get 5. But if I, it's like algebra. If I do this to 1, I've got to do it to the other. So my phosphorus is then going to be 2, right? And my oxygen is going to be 5. So if I get a decimal, I can't totally ignore it. I have to be able to get rid of it. But my final answer here is P2O5, or diphosphorus pentoxide. Now, there are some patterns and some options. If you get <clears throat> 0.25, you got to multiply all of them by 3. I'm sorry, by 4. 0.33, multiply all of them by 3 by 2, 3, and 4. And the most common ones that you see are the 0.5 and the 0.33, but technically all of them are fair game. So if you get a, a decimal, you also don't necessarily have to memorize it. You can just figure it out. Keep multiplying it by integers until you get a whole number. Okay. Now, molecular formulas are a little bit different. They're the actual formula for a compound. So just like we saw with the dinitrogen tetroxide, this would be the molecular formula. Now, it can be the same as the empirical, but it doesn't have to be. But to find the molecular, you need two things, the empirical formula of the compound and the actual molar mass or formula mass of the compound. And these are going to, a lot of times you have to find, you may have to find the empirical, but the actual molar mass is going to have to be given to you. Okay, so that should make your life a little bit easier. We compare them to see if how they how they uh, relate to one another, and then we see if we got to multiply. Okay, the last example, the empirical formula was found to be P2O5, diphosphorus pentoxide. Yeah. Experimentation shows the actual molar mass is 283.89. We want to know the molecular formula. Okay, so again, here is the actual molar mass. They gave it to me, just like I said they were going to have to. And um, the next step that we have to do is we have to find the molar mass of the empirical formula. So, because if they're the same, then we know it's going to be exactly the same. So if I find phosphorus on the periodic table, molar mass is 30.97. There are two of them. I have to add that to 5 times 16.00. 
I end up with um, 141.94, which is not what they gave me. Okay, so my next step, I have to divide the actual molar mass by the empirical formula's molar mass. So what they gave me on the last slide, now you always have to divide the larger number by the, by the smaller number um, because you're going to see why here in just a second. 0.89 divided by 141.94. Again, we're looking for a whole number here. This is going to come out to be 2. So then all I have to do is multiply this number by each subscript in the empirical formula. Okay, what does that mean? Well, my empirical formula was P2O5. So in essence, I have to multiply everything in that formula by 2. So my molecular formula for this compound is P4O10, or tetraphosphorus decoxide. Okay, tetraphosphorus decoxide. It's a little tricky, but again, it has to be whole numbers. You cannot write P4.62. 09.1. Okay, so if you're trying to do that, then you're way off base. Okay, um, we're going to do one more and then we're going to leave one to do in class together. For this one, this time they gave us percentage. What is the empirical formula of the following compound? Now, here, once they gave us percentages, the next first step is to go grams to moles, which is what I did down here. Now, if I divide by the smallest amount, which is divide all of them by 3.436, well guess what, they all come out to be about 1. Okay, they think this is like 9.98 or something like that, but it's close enough to 1. So that the empirical formula is simply going to be CHO. That's it, one of each, nothing too funky, um, but you don't overthink it. If you get a whole number, go with it. Now, if the actual molar mass is 116.07, what is the molecular formula? First step I got to do is find the molar mass of CHO. I've got one carbon, which is 12.01. I've got one oxygen, which is 1.01. I've got one, I'm sorry, one hydrogen, which is 1.01. One oxygen, which is 16.00, which gets me a molar mass of 29.02 grams per mole. Remember, then I divide the big number by the small number. So I'm going to take 116.07, divide it by 29.02, <coughs> and get to 4 and we just have to multiply it out. So if my empirical formula was CHO, I can multiply everything by 4, C4, H4, O4. Okay, we're going to do example 3 and talk through the reminders and tips in class, and I hope